let me take the case of oil. If the uh, 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 capitalists in the oil industry, very important raw material, if they get a monopoly, they can sell that particular very important raw material, energy, to other capitalists who now have to make a new subsumed class payment to the monopolized commodity. So in this particular case, if this was the uh, uh, oil, the few capitalists left in the oil industry, they would be selling their particular product to other capitalists, and they would be then getting a subsumed class revenue. Okay. So this would be the monopolist in this industry. They sell their commodity, say energy, to other capitalists. Those other capitalists have to take a cut of their surplus and make a new subsumed class payment to this group of capitalists, and that's their subsumed class revenue. Okay, so this reflects the price of this particular product greater than the, you know, this is the C commodity here. Okay, so this is a monopoly power in the C industry, means of production, oil. Okay, so the, the, the oil industry, the, the industry that refines that oil, standard oil and so forth, they can sell their commodity for a higher price than what it's worth in value terms. They get a subsumed class revenue, which is a subsumed class payment of these other industries that have to pay this now premium higher than the unit value. So their profit rate goes up too. As you can see, their profit rate now go, becomes the surplus plus this subsumed class revenue in this monopoly. So those capitalists in the selling industry that have this monopoly position have a higher rate of profit. Okay? However, uh, by the way, I, you know, just to be consistent here in terms of what we did before, you would have the surplus value plus this subsumed class revenue here. Um, and it's likely this would exceed the subsumed class payments plus the new expenditures that would be warranted. So this would be advertising and uh, lob lobbyists and so forth, lawyers, um, to help secure the the conditions of existence of this new monopoly revenues here. And my guess is that those revenues would exceed these new costs of advertising plus lawyers and so forth to maintain the monopoly position. Um, we might ask now the consequences of this. Okay. Well, here, let's see. I'm, I'll erase this and I'll put it below it. These are the, the capital good in industries. These are the sellers of this commodity, of this you know, raw material, sellers of C. Here, these are the buyers of C. The buyers have a surplus that they pump out of their workers, but now they have a new problem. They have all the subsumed class payments that they have to make to secure this, but they have a new one. They have to purchase this sea good, you know, oil. They have to purchase this sea good at a price, monopoly price, greater than its cost. Okay, that's on the input side. And so the inequality for them goes in this direction. So we have an interesting problem here. For the sellers, they get a surplus value plus a subsumed class revenue greater than the uh, uh, expenditures to secure it plus their uh, uh, X, whereas they benefit from monopoly, whereas the buyers are hurt by the monopoly position. And so you, you, know, you might ask, OK, since <coughs> we have in the, uh, in the, we have uh, the, you know, the juxtaposition of two different kinds of, of, of capitalists here, those capitalists that have a monopoly position by selling a raw material or a machine good at a price higher than the unit value, and those that have to pay, you know, which inequality outweighs? If this one outweighs this one, then the benefit here would exceed the cost, and the economy could expand because these capitalists might use this to, you know, expand subsumed class 
the payments. If the if that is not the case, if, the, if this inequality is very strong, then you might have a contraction across the U.S. economy because these monopolists have a, a, this kind of monopoly position. And this gets very interesting and complicated. For example, you might ask, what do capitalists do with these monopoly revenues? That is, if I just add back If I add back the monopoly in the consumer good industry that we started with, and now we have monopoly in the capital good industry, and if the inequalities are going in this way, then you can ask, OK, what do the capitalists do with these extra revenues? And that's very, very interesting and controversial. One argument that, that has emerged is that the capitalists will not attempt to expand the uh, supply of their particular uh, means of uh, subsistence or means of production because that will only tend to undermine their monopoly position. That's why, they, <laughs> that's why they're making use of advertising there to get people to buy it at a higher price. Okay? So they're not going to expand the supply, which would tend to undermine their monopoly position. So you have, which people have argued, uh, uh, that a monopoly capitalism may breed um, stagnation is that the firms are not pushing to expand the supply of, of uh, the particular commodities that they are monopolizing. And so you have, which is what an argument did appear in the 1960s and 70s, you have the combination of inflation, this wage price spiral, stagnation, and they called it, if I remember correctly, stagflation at the time. A new term was, was uh, coined to capture both the, the stagnation and the inflation. On the other hand, you also could make an argument that these great monopoly revenues here will stimulate these particular uh, uh, monopolized industries to use their extra profits that they're getting uh, from the, the monopoly position, that's this right over here, to enter into new industries or create new products. And in this particular case, you could make an argument that, comp that the very monopoly presence stimulates new forms of competition. And in fact, that's an argument that Marx actually made. So Marx, because you know, he's a master, of, you know, by now we all understand the dialectic, this overdetermination. So the, monopo the competition breeds monopoly, and then in turn the monopoly breeds competition. So you can think of a variety of different industries in which the very monopoly positions that they have in a particular product stimulates them to create all kinds of new competitive positions. For example, if this is the oil, if we're talking about oil here, so the oil uh, companies have both a, a, a non-class revenue because they sell gasoline to automobiles, that's a consumer good, that, that is the gasoline is a, is, is a consumer good, you need that obviously to run a car. So they get a non-class revenue, but they also get a subsumed class revenue because they sell uh, um, energy to other uh, capitalists who need that energy to produce uh, uh, goods in the economy. Okay. So if, if they're in a favored position to, to charge higher and higher prices at the pump and to other capitalists, so their revenues, their monopoly revenues rise, and of course their stock prices would rise, what do they do with their money? What do they do with their profits? Well, you know, people have argued one of the things that the board of directors may do with these rising monopoly revenues is to uh, create new forms of energy. They may invest in R&D, research and development on the right hand side, in, uh, in all kinds of new energy sources. Um, they have the wherewithal to do that and it would be a strategic kind of investment. Um, and if some of them pay off in new forms of energy, they will be producing new forms of, of, of commodities and hence will be able to make a surplus value in those um, in the future. But you can run that kind of, of uh, argument for a variety of different kinds of capitalists that would develop new kinds of strategies to produce new kinds of, of, of commodities in a variety of different industries um, in order to uh, uh, you know, be competitive there in the future or to create new kinds of competition for other firms which have a, a competitive position. The last thing I would like to do, and then I'm going to stop on this, is to just to take the example, because it's so important today, of uh, oil um, and, and run with that.
because it's an interesting example in which I can kind of summarize everything that we've done on this question of monopoly. Suppose we have then in this a very important product, which so far there are a few substitutes available in this case of oil. We have um, in a variety of different countries, uh, let's take say OPEC, we have uh, um, in these oil producing countries uh, uh, state um, uh, enterprises, they, that is the state sets up an enterprise to uh, pump oil out of the ground. And the cost of that in Marxian terms is C plus V plus SV. But since OPEC is a monopoly, it sells its oil at a price higher than the value. So it gets a subsumed class revenue. Okay. And it sells its oil to uh, other capitalists who refine that oil and produce energy, whether it be for the home and automobile or to use in, in factories. So OPEC sells the oil at a price, this is a C good, greater than the unit value. So this is the oil producing capitalists, literally pumping the oil out of the ground, barrels of oil. This is the cost, the total value of those oils. This is the subsumed class revenue that they can get because the, the countries, you know, go to Geneva or wherever they go, they sit around a table and the oil ministers the, decide a higher price for the oil greater than the unit value and then they allocate uh, how much, uh, how many barrels of oil the respective countries uh, can produce. So they can then sell their oil And it's a fairly inelastic demand because there's no really good substitute for oil right now. That's what everybody is trying to do, is to find this substitute for, for oil. And that would include, as I just mentioned to you, the oil companies uh, themselves. That is, the companies that refine this. So they get a nice subsumed class revenue. They sell the oil to um, oil refining capitalists around the world. Let me take the United States. Let me focus on the U.S. So we have, in the, in, in, in the case of the United States, we have capitalists who purchase barrels of oil and then refine it. You know, the, for those of you uh, who are familiar with this, uh, between uh, New York City and Philadelphia, we have a variety of, of companies there along the New Jersey Turnpike um, on the East Coast that refine this oil. So that's not the only place, obviously, but that's one place that I'm familiar with. So these oil refining companies, they get a, um, they get a, 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 a surplus value. They get the C plus V plus SV. They get a surplus value. Okay. But they also refine the oil. So this is the surplus they get in refining the oil. But they're able to sell this at the pump at the gas pump for a price higher than the, the unit value, and so they get a non-class revenue. And what this is, the monopoly position at the pump, at the gas pump, <laughs> let me at the pump, for means of subsistence, for consumer goods. So here is the first thing we discussed. This is the non-class revenue they get by selling it the good at a price higher than unit value. But they also sell to other capitalists. So they also get a subsumed class revenue. Okay. And of course, they have the subsumed class payments to secure this in New Jersey, plus the, the uh, uh, Y, plus, if I, I hope I got the same right terms here, plus the X to secure these respective monopoly positions. This would be then you know, advertising and lawyers here um, for these respective monopoly positions. And my guess is the inequality goes this way. 